Well, hello and welcome to the Tim Masso podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. And by us, I do mean distinguished company, not myself, but Joshua Shapiro, Geosher and watchmaker. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. I'm a big fan of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm the uh, internet equivalent of junk mail in the watch space, so I am hard to avoid. So today, uh, your point of reference among dial craftsmen, but your interest in your skills include watchmaking, skeletonizing, engraving, and of course, your dials. So which passion came first and how did you get into this world? Well, so for me, it started off as, as a hobby. Uh, I already had a career as a teacher and as a principal in the high school. And watchmaking was just a fun hobby on the side. I grew up around a machine shop when I was a kid. Um, and then, you know, went on and got a history degree and a master's in history and became a teacher. And then around the time I got married, I just got the urge to work with my hands again. And, uh, you know, I chose watchmaking as, as the hobby that was for me. And it kind of just grew from there. Very cool. So were there any, I mean, you grew up around machines and, you know, the technical process, but your background is in history. I see a lot of guys who go from some sort of engineering or technical trades into watchmaking. Your background is very different. So were there any influences in your career, either early or more contemporary or, or historical influences who drove you toward this? Yeah, very early on, I discovered uh, the watchmaking book, the Bible, George Daniels. And that was that was very inspiring. You know, I talk with other watchmakers and, you know, inevitably when you first pick up Daniel's watchmaking, you understand a very small what he's saying in the book. And uh, over time, as you learn more and more, you, you get a little bit, you understand a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And uh, for me, that was, that was really the start. And very quickly, I, I got enthralled with engine turning with Guilloche, uh, which he has a whole section of that in the book. And uh, at the same time, Roger Smith had just put out some videos on engine turning and it looked amazing to me. And I decided, I, at that point, I'd already been doing some watch skeletonizations and been doing it just as, as fun and for friends. And uh, when I saw those engine turning machines, I said, okay, I'm gonna save up for these. And, uh, that was kind of the start of when I started taking things real seriously. So I know Roland Murphy has said that he fought the Swiss and Europeans for years to try to get his hands on vintage engines. You've got three straight line machines and a rose lathe. How did you track these down being an American and kind of foreign to the process? Yeah, so uh, interesting enough, um, it's easier to get machines, great machines in America now than it is in Switzerland. In Switzerland, the big brands buy them up and lock them up. Uh, and uh, in the United States, there are a lot of these machines that were used for many things besides just watches. Uh, engine turning machines were used for cufflinks, for napkin rings, for boxes, for cigarette lighters, all sorts of things. And the US was heavily involved in that industry. So uh, there's been many times where uh, the Swiss have come to the United States to get machines, uh, you know, from them, either machines that came from Germany, Switzerland, or Great Britain that ended up here. For me personally, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And uh, I've made a lot of connections over the years and I have been able to source a lot of these machines. And some of it is just luck. Uh, it used to be when I got insomnia, I would spend time just doing deep searches on the internet in really obscure places to try to find these machines. And that actually got me a few machines from a late night uh, Google searching. Uh, but that's, that's, that's pretty rare and I was pretty lucky. Yes, I mean, th that's actually completely the opposite of what I expected. I never anticipated that you'd have more luck finding this equipment in the United States. Uh, so was it all in the old watchmaking and industrial heartland of like the Midwest, or were you able to track down some of these engines uh, in the West Coast area? Uh, so there, there was a person that had uh, two of the machines, my Rose engine machine and my straight line machine in the Bay Area. 
but he had sourced them from a machine reseller in, uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, that was a huge, the, the East Coast was really the Mecca for watchmaking and jewelry making. So a tremendous amount of watchmaking tools and jewelry tools were in factories on the East Coast, obviously. And uh, there was a machine reseller named David Gold and he was kind of infamous for uh, buying out entire watchmaking factories in the United States and jewelry factories and having these machines. Uh, there's sort of a big misconception about watchmaking machines in the United States. Uh, you know, we had a huge industry here. So we imported all sorts of the best machinery from Switzerland, uh, as well as making some of the best machines in the world here in the United States, like Harding, for instance. Uh, so there's a lot of watchmaking equipment here. I heard a story once that uh, uh, someone went and visited a, a Swiss factory and uh, the, the Swiss watchmakers, they were very surprised that there are all these watchmaking machines in America and they couldn't figure out what these machines were doing there. And they figured they must've been used for arms manufacture because why else would Americans have watchmaking machines? Um, and so I kind of laughed at that, but uh, uh, there's sort of that misconception um, about Americans and tools here, but there's a lot of great machines out there. Uh, speaking Especially of also the aerospace industry, like I'm in Southern California. So there's a plethora of, you know, amazing machines here. Yeah. I want to also apologize um, on behalf of my machines, the ecosystem of Apple devices means a call tried to come in through my computer. So you have my apologies for that. Okay, no problem. Okay, so now I know a lot of watch enthusiasts appreciate the appearance of Guilloche on a dial, but they underestimate mm -hmm. just how artisanal it is. They think, well, okay, you get the blank, the machine carves the pattern, what's the big deal? But it takes up to 40 hours just to make a piece of a piece of your dial. And that's the subsecond yeah. from the infinity weave. Take me through the process, starting with the idea, the drawing, setting up the lathe, and actually executing one of your infinity series dials. Because I think people would be amazed by how time consuming it is. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, you know, in, in any business, when you're starting out doing something new, you've got to do something to differentiate yourself, something that you do better than anybody else. And, uh, you know, I kind of conceived of the idea of the infinity weave. Uh, that was Eric going to the other room to do some machining. Uh, so uh, I wanted to take the basket weave to the next level. So I thought of this idea of a basket weave within a basket weave. And so you start with an idea and then you kind of work backwards. Okay, so now I have the idea, what do I need to do it? And so I had to invent a pattern bar, a cam that could pull it off. Then once uh, I drew up that, I had it made. Great, now let's see uh, if I can actually do it on the machine. Great, I did it on the machine. Uh, now can I actually make it look good and have the dexterity to actually pull it off? And that took about a year of practice before uh, I could do something that I was proud of to put out in the world. And I, I still have a high failure rate. Now, I just posted recently on Instagram, you know, seven failed infinity weaves, and I probably got seven successful ones out of uh, that batch. So the failure rate is still uh, very high. In terms of the process, you can see the, the straight line machines behind me, but uh, you're setting the machines to different numbers as you're moving your cutter across and the, the cam that traces the pattern, you're constantly shifting that with numbers as well. So you have to keep track of where you are. You're constantly indexing the machine. And then on top of that, I'm making absolutely tiny, tiny, tiny movements with my hands. And I have to make sure I don't slip. If I slip, I go into the, the big boxes the little boxes will slip into the big boxes and then it's scrap. So it's a, it's a combination of, you know, always having your wits about you where you are mathematically, uh, indexing the machine, and then 
absolutely having the right touch and feel with your hands to make sure you, um, make sure you don't slip. I think that's a great way to describe it because a lot of folks see guilloche main on many dials and they think, well, how can it be hand guilloche if a machine does it? And I can clearly see just how hands-on that process is from what you described. Yeah, let me grab something for you. Sure, thank you. So this is a, a slide for a straight line machine. And my thumb goes back here and it's sliding in and out of a dovetail that holds this. And so this is all by touch, just sort of like a hand engraver has a engraver in his hand and he's pushing that and has to have the absolute right feel. With engine turning, you're controlling this to make sure that you're getting the right depth of pressure. If you push too hard, the machine will slip. If you don't press hard enough, the cuts aren't deep enough. Um, so that's sort of the, the hand aspect of it. And also there's no engine on these, there's no motor on this. So you're using your hand to move a hand wheel that moves the machine. Um, just as sort of a, a clarification, there's something called a brocading machine. And Audemars Piguet uses those to get their pattern uh, on their Royal Oak dials. And that's much more of an automated process. They can let that machine run without anybody touching that machine. Uh, but Rose Engine and Straight Line machines uh, are uh, a lot more skill-based and hands-on, literally. So, well, we're putting the machine back together right now. Okay. So if you're spending 40 hours just on the sub seconds dial of an infinity series, full guilloche dial, how long does it take to get through the full process? Um, and could you tell us a little bit about how you silver your dials? Because I know at FP Journe, they use a galvanic bath and that's not how you do it. Right, right, right. Um, many brands use, uh, uh, a galvanic bath and other types of paint or lacquers. And that's how you can get a, like a lot of different colors. Uh, there's a lot of color options when you do that. Uh, so um, we'll answer your first question. So a straight line pattern, like the basket weave or infinity weave is a lot more time consuming uh, than a rose engine pattern. A rose engine pattern is a circular pattern. And any um, watch enthusiast can literally count the lines on uh, a rose engine pattern, which will have a, be a circular pattern. Any straight line pattern, you'll see vertical lines. So for instance, in the basket weave on my dials is about 160 uh, straight lines, straight line operations. But a rose engine pattern could be a handful. Uh, it could be 20 lines, it could be 30 lines. So that goes a lot quicker. The basket weave can take up to a day, um, but a rose engine pattern can take you know, maybe an hour or so. And then the infinity weave uh, has hundreds of operations in it and is much, much slower. Sorry, we're in the, the, the main walkway. No, it's good. My... It, it makes me feel better because um, I'm about the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, the silvering process, it has a few different names. In the watchmaking world, it's referred to as Breguet frosting. And in uh, the jewelry world, it's called depletion gilding. So uh, the way the process works is you have a raw piece of silver or an engine turned piece of silver. And uh, you apply uh, an open flame to the dial and the impurities in the silver, silver is usually 92.5% silver, and then copper and other um, alloys as well. And so when you apply heat, it oxidizes and brings the impurities to the surface. Then you take that dial now that has, that doesn't look good at all. It's got a lot of black and oxidation, and you put that into a bath of acid. The acid burns off the impurities on that top layer and then you repeat the process again. And when you heat it up again, it's probably still black. And then you keep repeating the process again and again and again until eventually 
you're getting a pure layer of silver, which uh, has a white matte look to it. And uh, it's a really fun process and it's a really rewarding process because you see your dial transform from a normal silver steel color into this almost glowing matte white color. And that's very um, tarnish resistant. If you look at Breguet pocket watches from over 200 years ago, besides where watchmakers have slipped, uh, you'll see like still the, the white frosting. It's something that you can easily redo. So an engine turn dial with that frosting, you can very quickly bring it back to how it was, uh, but just by repeating that process again. Unlike uh, paint where if uh, it gets tropical or something like that happens, you know, the, the dial is in big trouble. You'd have to completely strip off all the paint and then repaint it and find the perfect paints and the perfect lacquer and in the process, you've probably lost all your uh, dial printing, um, all your pad printing. So I like doing this process because it's something that will last the ages. Uh, we also engrave our numerals and fill it with ink, which uh, Breguet also did and many watchmakers before them, uh, just because it's something also that you can refinish and redo and uh, that helps the longevity of the dial. Yeah. Now, in terms of actually building up the dial, your dials are multi-part. You do use ink to fill in some of the characters. And Correct. this is a rather involved process. It's not common to be using screws to actually assemble a dial. Uh, could you explain why you chose that process despite the extra labor involved? So I like having more labor involved on the, the, the front end than the potential of making a mistake and having to start all over again. So for instance, if I made an engine turn dial that was all a single piece of metal, if I make a mistake in any part of that dial, now the entire dial is scrap. So with the way I do my dials, you know, we're investing the same amount of time by making all these different parts and we have to do more operations but if anything goes wrong with any part of it, now the entire dial isn't scrap. So especially when I'm spending so much time on the infinity weave, uh, if I mess up on some other part of the dial, you know, that infinity weave isn't scrap. If we mess up on the chapter ring, the engine turning isn't done for. And also, like I said before, it also means that uh, the, the, the ability to fix anything that goes wrong with the dial in the future uh, is there. You know, it's, it's much easier to service the dial than if it was a single piece. Now you've branched out to include hands too, I believe. Could you talk a little bit about some of the process involved there? Cause you achieve a beautiful multi-tonal sort of color character on the hands that you build. Yeah. So we, we do it pretty traditionally, you know, we, we, we blank out the, the hands using a machine and then arts are uh, spends a tremendous amount of time hand finishing them uh, using all traditional techniques. And, uh, you know, and then we, we hand blue them. We do it in a very traditional manner. So, you know, the, the bluing isn't perfect, perfect like you get in a, uh, a vacuum oven, um, which is, you know, like a mass production technique. But I don't like doing things that way anyway. Uh, so this is, this is a very traditional way of, of making hands. Um, you know, many operations go into it. A lot of time goes into each one of those hands and, uh, you know, it makes them very special. Uh, I wanted to comment. Um, we used to only fill in our numerals with ink, but we started doing kind of a, a really neat process where uh, we'll use a steel chapter ring and we'll hand engrave the numerals and then we'll blue the entire chapter ring and then remove the bluing everywhere but inside the numerals because the numerals are engraved, they're deeper down. So when you grain the top surface, you're left with uh, blued hand engraved numerals. And we've also done the same with plating too, where we've hand engraved it on silver, grain the top surface, and then you have plated hand engraved numerals. Um, and uh, you know that hasn't been done a whole lot. And it's a, it's a really beautiful process. And that's what I've been doing a lot more in my watches recently. 
Now, your watchmaking is, is kind of grown by leaps and bounds, too. And the Infinity series, for now, are using a UWD movement, which I think is built by a subsidiary of Longwintina. But you have ambitions to build yes. the entirety of the watch. Are you allowed to give us any kind of yes. advanced scouting about what the new movement will be like? Yeah, sure. Well, even before that, you know, I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into making our own cases. Uh, we've been working on that for uh, almost a year now. Um, and we, uh, we decided to start uh, with the bar high. Our, our first cases uh, have been tantalum and titanium, uh, two of the most difficult metals to work with. And uh, today or tomorrow, we're going to have our first batch of cases complete, complete. We're just drilling the holes for the spring bar right now. Uh, so that's very exciting. That's that's a, a huge, huge step in the right direction. Uh, we've also been working on a prototype in-house movement where we've been making our bridges, wheels, and even pinions, which is also really a big deal for us. And it's always been my goal, uh, ever since I picked up watchmaking, to go the whole way. And you know, I, I figured I would start with engine turning. And as the company grew, I'd just try to go for it. And we're, we're there. We've amassed the machinery. I've got the team. Um, and uh, now we're, we're really making progress. And it's very, very, very exciting. Now, it's clear that Southern California is pretty far from La Chaux de Fonds. Where do you find folks locally <laughs> who are qualified to help you with this? Yeah, so uh, I have to do a lot of scouting. Uh, I have to do a lot of scouting. So Arthur, who works with me, uh, I got lucky with him. Ariel Adams from Blog to Watch introduced us together uh, as we were all LA locals. And he's a, a master hand engraver that was doing a lot of watch skeletonization. And uh, you know, we've been working together for three, four years now. Um, so he's one of my watchmakers. And uh, the other two, uh, you know, many watchmakers are very content just doing service and repair. And it's rare to find a watchmaker that in their spare time, they enjoy making things. And that's the, the type of watchmaker that, uh, you know, I look to employ. And I found two of them and they're extremely talented, um, great guys. Uh, you know, with a lot of experience, both with watchmaking and are passionate about making. And, um, you know, now we've got a really solid team and it's pretty exciting. Like we're, we're able to split up all the jobs and all the labor into what people really enjoy doing. Um, both of them were kind of working more mundane uh, service repair jobs before this. And, uh, you know, kind of leapt at the opportunity to work at a watch manufacturer. There's not very many of them in the United States, uh, period. So the opportunity to work at a place like this is pretty rare. Um, I'm just really appreciative that I was able to find some talented individuals. And for our audience out in cyberspace, uh, Artur is Artur Akmeyev, who is a, a polymath artisan, everything from jewelry to castings to watchmaking. And fun fact, I believe he was the guy who cast the platinum movements for David Walter, like the blanks for them in platinum. So he's a true. Uh, he engraved them. He engraved them. Yeah. So yeah. speaking of other folks, um, there are other watch brands in the world, and clearly everyone gets their start someplace. Are you a collector of watches or clocks generally? And if so, what's in your collection? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so over the years, whenever I need to get information on a watch where I'm interested in, guess whose videos I end up watching on YouTube? <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah, big time. Like uh, you give such crystal clear explanations for watches and you get such fantastic video on them. Uh, I'd like to say, I hope uh, one day you'll be holding one of my watches. Uh, for that, but that means someone uh, sold one. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it could uh, be mine. It could be mine down the road. You never know. You never know. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, I started out, you know, 
uh, initially super interested in skeleton watches. Uh, my wife got me a watch for our wedding and I walked into a local watch retailer named Feldmar here. And they had a huge poster of the Chrono Swiss Opus uh, watch um, in their shop. And I just stared at it for a while and was really enthralled and got obsessed with skeleton watches. So all my first watches were skeleton watches that I purchased. And then I thought, I wanna do this myself. And so that's when I got into watchmaking and started skeletonizing. Um, and at the same time, I very quickly moved on to vintage watches, which I guess isn't surprising because I'm obsessed with history. Uh, so, uh, you know, I started with Omega and then I got really got into pocket watches. Um, and, uh, you know, then I, I got into some modern Omegas like the Aquaterra. Uh, and at this point it was still a hobby. And, uh, you know, then I had amassed my first set of Rose Engine machines. And I, it was still a hobby. I was starting to get serious. Uh, and then Aldous Hodge, uh, the actor, um, contacted me and uh, purchased my first set of, of Rose Engine machines. And uh, I thought, okay, well, it's a hobby. Um, I should do something fun with this money. And so I bought a, a Patek Calatrava uh, 5296. And I had that watch for about two months and said, nope, I, I'm I, not having the machines. I, I know what I wanna do now. I have sort of hit my goals as a watch collector now I'm ready to go all into watchmaking. So I sold that watch and I sold my 67 Mustang Fastback Ouch. and I bought another. Set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, bought another set of uh, Rose Engine straight line machines and some other equipment and have never looked back since. Though I did pick up recently a uh, Omega Seamaster from the 1960s with a 321 movement in it. Uh, it was pristine, new old stock. Uh, the movement hadn't been touched. The dial looked like it came out of Omega yesterday. Um, as you might expect, I'm a little obsessed with dials. So even when I get vintage watches, if there's anything wrong with the dial, it just starts to bother me over time. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. I know it's the feeling I get when I see a watch that's been refinished. I'm like, oh God, why did you do this, man? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I'm, I'm that way with cases. You're that way with dials. I'm that way with cases. So the broader world of watchmaking is out there, and there are a lot of independents on the scene. Um, and some of them are, you know, enamored of each other in, in mutual fashion. I spoke with uh, David Brailsford of Garrick Watchmakers, and I asked him who he really mm. admired in the watch space today, and he mentioned you. So I'm just wondering. Oh, wow. Any, oh, yeah, big time, he said. And like, to the extent that the work you do helps to inspire what they do on their guilloche dials. Um, are there any artists wow. or watchmakers you admire? If he's watching, thank you. That's a big compliment. They make such beautiful watches there, Garrick. That's a big compliment. Whew. Well, uh, you know, I was really, really inspired by George Daniels and Roger Smith. Really, really, really in inspired. Um, uh, and I say it especially so Roger Smith, because, you know, his story was just of uh, an ordinary person that worked out of his garage for seven years um, and then got picked up as George Daniels apprentice. And that made me feel like this dream is possible for myself. And he was really free with his knowledge, both on the Internet and even when I would uh, email and talk with him. And uh, so really, really appreciative of that. Uh, Kari Vutalainen uh, is a really impressive individual. He's also, uh, you can email and talk with him. Um, he has, his CNC machines are uh, from Haas, which is here in Southern California. And I also have uh, some of the same CNC machines. So I've emailed him questions about that before, um, but the, the work he's doing, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that in the watchmaking industry, uh, it's very easy to make a watch by using the phone. Uh, Philip Dufour is kind of famous for saying that quote that a lot of watchmakers make a watch uh, with their telephone. And uh, 
it takes a tremendous amount of investment and uh, risk and tenacity to make your own parts. And uh, Kari is one of the few people out there uh, that does just about everything under his own roof and then uh, shares it with other people and you know, collaborates with other individuals or uh, will make parts and small runs for other individuals. And uh, it's not easy to get to that point and it's not easy to run a business like that. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Yeah. So now you've done what pretty much every watch enthusiast has ever dreamed of doing. And I'm fortunate to say I'm in that club too. You've taken a passion in the watch space and you've turned it into a career. Have you also walked away from your previous career in education? Because you were an educator and a vice yeah. principal. And I mean, you, you had a full deck of cards in education. Have you wound that down or are you still doing both? Yeah, so I... Uh... Over the last few years, I started winding it down and reducing my role in the school that I, I really helped start. And this year it was very bittersweet. This year uh, I left completely and uh, that was an extremely difficult decision. Uh, but I think it was the right decision. Uh, you know, it was, it was time to dedicate myself completely to this business. You know, in, I started off as a coach in education and I did that for six years. And then I was a teacher for three years and then uh, a principal for almost seven years. So I feel I really pursued that career uh, all the way as far as I could. You know, there are a lot of great moments, a lot of difficult moments. I was working with teenagers. So that's always uh, taxing for the soul, but also very rewarding. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I was ready for this next step, this next huge challenge of you know, bringing back American watchmaking and uh, doing amazing things here. And, you know, I still have a lot of teaching opportunities here, whether it's, you know, having others come and visit and teaching them about watchmaking or doing podcasts like this, or even with my watchmakers, when I can show them something uh, and they're often showing me things, I'm always learning. So yeah, once a teacher, always a teacher, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm out of the education field and in completely in the watchmaking field. So I was lucky I had that to, for years to invest everything back into watchmaking. I could use my salary from being a principal to pay for my uh, life and my family and my kids and everything from watchmaking. I was just reinvesting back into the company and amassing more equipment. Now, this is fascinating because now you're all in with watchmaking, but to a degree that very few independents are, you're going to be making the dial, you're going to be making the case, you're going to be making the movement. Uh, could you share any details about what the upcoming watch or watches will be like, uh, design, size, or complication, anything you, you can disclose publicly? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, I guess the first thing I'm going to disclose is... Uh, I'm gonna take my sweet time with it. We already have a, a prototype movement uh, that is a working prototype movement, uh, but uh, the Infinity Series and the success of that is giving me the ability to, to sit and take our time with it. Uh, and that's what, I, what I've what i always wanted, to not feel like a financial pressure, like I, I need to get this watch out. Like I don't have a board of directors. Uh, I can just take my time and do something beautiful and wonderful. Uh, the, we're gonna be making two. One is a time only uh, manual line movement. Uh, it's a stop second, uh, very simple movement, but we're making nearly all the components inside of it. And we're also working on a turbulent moon phase as well. Uh, and that'll be the focus of almost all of 2022 is working on these movements. Uh, the uh, the time only manual line, that'll be a 38 millimeter case and the turbion will be a little bit larger than that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. We're, we're very, very excited. Humbled uh, and excited. I'm hoping that we can see some of the progress on Instagram. Yeah, I, 
I have I have mixed feelings about that. I uh, I personally my my preference is to kind of show things when they're done and then work backwards. Uh, you know, we've already had, I don't know, 10, 12 revisions of uh, the watch and movement and design, and I'm sure we're gonna have more revisions. And, uh, you know, when I post something, I kind of want it to be what I've, we finally decided on. And then I'd be happy kind of to work backwards, but I don't know if I want to knee jerk the, the public around uh, through all of our ugly designs uh, before we nailed something. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. Um, have you considered adding adding dial colors? I realize it would require getting away from from your core fabrication um, and maybe considering galvanic finishes. But have you ever thought about that? Oh yeah. So I mean, first off, right now um, we've experimented with blues and blacks. You know, we've had complete watches with blues on it usually through either a, uh, uh, an anodizing process. Like we made a crystallized titanium dial that we anodized to get the blue color. Uh, we've done platings to get ruthenium and black ruthenium. And uh, you know, we, with the green phase, I have gotten some requests for some green watches. And so that'll be a galvanic process. Uh, uh, you can anodize titanium to green, but it's not the green people want. Uh, yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. So I have to say that with the last year and a half of COVID, seeing what it's been like to try to run schools and educate people during COVID, I've thought, thank God I'm 37 years old and I didn't have to go through <laughs> school or college remotely. That's got to be a challenge. Yeah. So you faced that, but you've also had to reach out to clients from Southern California without the ability to really travel or go to shows. So how does a low volume American craftsman in Southern California reach out and connect with clients right now, given these times? Yeah, so uh, a lot of my business has been through Instagram and my customers are all over the world. So COVID wasn't a huge change in how I interact with customers. Uh, and uh, as soon as the vaccinations came out, you know, customers started visiting me again when they started traveling because Los Angeles is just a, a vacation destination uh, or, or also for business. So people are constantly coming through here. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't, that wasn't so much of a huge change. That wasn't so much of a huge change. You know, many of my customers, uh, will try to come and pick up the watch when it's ready. But I'd say that's only 50% of them. 50% of my customers, if not more, I've never met uh, in person. And I've never even seen my watches in person. Many of them are just uh, trusting that I'm not creating the world's best CGI on my Instagram um, and uh, like what they see and, and purchase based off of that. So do you have any dealers or is all of your business direct? So I work with uh, Jeremy Oster in Denver. Uh, he's a retailer there. He sold a few of my watches. And newly, uh, I've started working with uh, Danny Goldsmith uh, with Goldsmith and Complications in Florida. Um, and I'll be doing something with him later on down the road. But for the most part, it's, it's not, it's, it's all, through, uh, all through me. And all, the great majority of my customers, they, they want to interact with me. They want to have conversations. I guess that's part of the joy of working with an independent versus a giant faceless brand. You know, you don't, you don't get to meet the, the watchmaker that made your watch at Rolex, but with an independent, you can sit down and have a conversation with me. And, um, you know, I can show you progress of what's going on with your watch. I've even had customers that have come and, uh, actually engine turned a part of their own dial. Uh, and so that's something, you know, that uh, the, the Richmond and Swatch Group can't really offer, um, but I can. And so that's, that's really the fun part. That's really the fun part of the whole thing. So sort of as we draw to a close, I want to make sure people know how to reach out and touch you. You're on Instagram. Do you have a physical shop? How do people reach out, get in touch, and get closer to your brand to make that decision? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, like many brands, I'm falling victim to having a very active Instagram and the most, not the most active website. Um, I'm hearing more and more of my collectors kind of grumble that like, uh, you know, if they want to find out the latest and the greatest, they have to go on Instagram to uh, see what brands are doing. Uh, so Instagram is a great way. Uh, I have a website, janeshapirowatches.com. Uh, my email is josh at janeshapirowatches.com. And, uh, you know, I'm quick to respond and, and happy to have visitors and, uh, you know, uh, I like talking to people and I like uh, showing them what we're very passionate about. And I certainly appreciate this talk. Thank you so much, Josh. This has been an absolute pleasure.